salutations to Pooja Swamiji and to all the sadhakas. Pranam. Hariyo. <clears throat> it's uh, my honor to extend a warm invitation to Swamiji. Swamiji has been a source of inspiration and guidance to all of us for the last few years. Now, uh, with a very mixed emotion, I'm speaking because uh, uh, <clears throat> Swamiji is uh, planning to move to USA. It's a sadness to say farewell, but at the same time, it is ex excitement as he embarked on this new chapter for Chinmaya Mission in USA. Throughout his time with us, Swamiji talks have always been a source of wisdom, inspiration, and practical guidance, especially the answers he had given to our simple or stupid question we say was uh, from a different plane. <clears throat> His uh, teachings are deeply uh, rooted in Vedas and uh, uh, Gita, but the examples given are highly relevant to the modern lives. That was very inspiring. As Swamiji is preparing to leave for USA, we have a unique opportunity to benefit from his teachings on one more time before he depart to USA. We are grateful for this time and uh, we have had with him. Uh, we hope that Swamiji will continue to guide us from, from there and uh, looking forward to see you here in UAE, when you are coming next time, we always cherish our memories for our time with you in Mangalore last time. So this, I invite you for this session. Aryam Swamiji. Uh, Swamiji, our first uh, session is, uh, if you could kindly um, give us a summary of uh, Bhagavad Gita chapter 14, uh, because we've just 
uh, completed uh, this chapter. So if we can have uh, um, your interpretation or your summary of it, uh, it will help us crystallize whatever we have learned of this chapter. Uh, how many classes you had taken to finish chapter 14? Swamiji, every class we take only one verse. So almost 27 classes we have taken. Oh, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> 27 classes means it's almost half an year. Yes, yes. It, we see, we have started, uh, Swamiji, 2011 years. We only come to chapter 14. Oh. <laughs> okay. Only if Gurudev is put two verses together when in his commentary, then ah. we take that together. Otherwise, okay, we okay. take one verse. So, okay. So, the 14th chapter is a very, very sadhana-oriented chapter. It is not just a theoretical, but sadhana-oriented chapter. So those who have practiced looking within, those who are meditation-oriented people, there are a lot of valuable guidance present in this chapter. So in the beginning itself, Bhagavan makes it clear. Sattvam rajastama iti guna prakriti sambhavaha nibadhranti mahabaho dehe dehinam avyayam. So Bhagavan says, this dehi who is avyayam, imperishable, who is of the nature of pure consciousness, Sachit anand, immortal, infinite, perfect. That is the nature of Dehi. He is Avyaya. But what happens to him? Nibadhnanti. He is bound. He is bound. Where is he bound? Dehe Nibadhnanti. He is bound to the body. Who binds him? Sattvam Rajasthama. These gunas, where are these gunas coming from? Prakriti Sambhavaha, it is born out of Prakriti. So this Satchidananda Swarupa, pure consciousness, which is, we all are. This being, the supreme being is bound to the body through the three gunas. So now this bondage has to be understood. Is it a real bondage, solid gross bondage? No, it is an imaginary bondage. So we all have studied this identification theory many times we have seen. Consciousness, when it identifies with the BMI. So this identification is what is called as bondage here. Binding, attachment, identification, feeling a sense of oneness. They are all different, different terms. So now, I, the infinite consciousness, it is, is getting bound to the body. So what is this nature of this bondage? It has to be an imaginary thing because this bondage is caused by the mind. Sattvam rajasthama. Where is it? It is in the mind. So it is the mind which is causing this bondage. Where is this mind coming from? Prakriti Sambhavaha. It is born out of Prakriti or Maya. What is the nature of Maya? Maya is that which is not there but which is experienced. So this bondage also is something which is not there but it is experienced. So it's an illusory bondage. Illusory bondage which is experienced. Mind is born of Maya, so all the properties of Maya, mind also should have. What is the nature of Maya? It is Trigunatmika. Karana Gunaha Karye Anvartanti. The Maya is made of three Gunas. So, mind which is a product of Maya also must have three Gunas. So, these three Gunas are mentioned in this verse. Sattvam Rajasthama Iti. 
गुणा प्रकृति संभवा निबध्नि महाबाहो देहे देहिनम अव्ययम सो दिस बॉन्डेज हैज टू बी अंडरस्टूड द नेचर ऑफ बॉन्डेज हैज टू बी अंडरस्टूड दिस बॉन्डेज इज नॉट रियल इट इज एन इल्यूजरी बॉन्डेज विच इज एक्सपीरियंस्ड हू इज क्रिएटिंग दिस बॉन्डेज इट इज द माइंड विच इज क्रिएटिंग दिस बॉन्डेज आइडेंटिफिकेशन इज कॉस्ड बाय द माइंड सो वॉट विल बी लिबरेशन we feel that we are bound to this body this is called bondage so freedom from this bondage of body is must be called as liberation so identification with the body is the cause of bondage so this identification from the body has to be called liberation we should no more feel our oneness with the body this is liberation the infinite when it identifies with the finite experiences the imperfections of the finite this experience of imperfection is the lakshana of bondage so identification created the trouble so this identification is the solution so this much the fundamentals of vedanta we should be clear now the next question is how to disidentify is there any qualification for the mind to disidentify from the body is there any qualification so then the, the whole chapter says that yes any mind cannot disidentify a rajasic mind cannot disidentify a tamasic mind cannot disidentify it's only a sattvic mind which can disidentify such a sattvic mind is called a qualified mind a prepared mind in the language of vedanta a sadhana chatushtaya sampanna mind such a mind alone is qualified for disidentification so next the question comes then please define what is a sattvic mind please define what is a rajasic and a tamasic mind so then the whole chapter goes on describing the nature of a mind how we behave when we are in these moods what is the nature of the mind in these moods what happens to that person in these moods the behavioral characteristics under the influence of these moods are described in this chapter so that we can identify in which mood we are in so what is the nature of a sattvic mind so when a person is in sattvic mind he is fully alert prakashakam that is a term used prakasha bright brilliant when brilliant light is there everything is clear so when that person is in sattvic mind everything is very clear there is no doubt there is clarity in decision making there is freshness there is no dullness there is tremendous interest in gaining knowledge such a mind is a peaceful mind alert mind cheerful mind clear mind all virtues are seen in such a mind such a mind is automatically attracted towards knowledge such a mind is a non indulgent mind such a mind is an introverted mind such a mind is a god oriented mind such a mind is filled with devotion dispassion etc so such a state of mind is what is called as a sattvic mind so in such a mind you enjoy the company of such a mind you are at your best when you are possessing a sattvic mind so this is how the whole chapter defines a sattvic mind sattvic mind means what a mind which is overpowered by sattva mind has got all the modes when mind is overpowered by sattva these are the lakshanas a person experiences then comes the next rajasic mind so when rajas overpowers a person what is his what is his behavior 
when rages over powers such a mind is an extroverted mind a sensuous mind a mind which is agitated worry anxiety tension etc is natural in such a mind such a mind makes that person indulgent in all worldly pleasures hmm. such a mind makes the person enter into all extroverted activities it is not at all a joy to possess such a mind if at all there is some joy it may be egoistic joys worldly joys these are the only joys known to a rajasic mind such a mind is generally self centered and selfish narrow minded so if you find such and of course in the 70th chapter you will find they they love a particular food also so when rages overpower the mind we generally love spicy masaledar food khara etc <laughs> this is the nature oily food spicy food a satvik person will be automatically attracted towards healthy food fruits milk etc satvik food so this is what the 17th chapter says okay uh so that is about rajasic mind then what about the tamasic mind in tamasic mind it is more of dullness laziness rajas expresses as activity sattva expresses as alert inactivity whereas tamas has neither interest in knowledge nor has it any interest in action sattva generally represents knowledge rajas represents action so tamas is that state where a person has no interest in knowledge or action so when the tamas overpowers us we become lazy sleepy etc procrastinating nidra alasya pramada can we say that we you know tamas is bad no no there are times when tamas is necessary so basically this tamasic quality is used to give us rest so in that sense tamas is also helpful there are times we need rest so when tamas overpowers us the body and the mind gets rest so every guna has its own importance has its own place right so what is this chapter saying when we are possessed of tamas and rajas the mind is not prepared for higher sadhana so therefore the mind has to be trained in sattva if we have to proceed in higher sadhana how to cultivate sattva it is only by abhyasa there is no other way the more and more we expose the mind in sattvic practices the mind gains sattvic sattvic samskaras this is the only way to uh, inculcate sattvic samskaras practice so whether it is studies whether it is bhajans whether it is meditation japa all those sattvic sadhanas will make the mind sattvic whatever we expose the mind to that the mind will acquire if we expose the mind to rajasic ways then the mind becomes rajasic but yes in all of us sattva is there rajas is there tamas is there there is nobody who is 100% sattvic or 100% tamasic there is no such thing combination is there whichever guna or powers us accordingly we behave in a sattvic person generally we can say 80% or so he is in sattva but there are times when he is overpowered by rajas and tamas also how much ever great that person may be so this is what the chapter says so all the sadhanas are meant for cultivating sattvic tendencies making the mind sattvic to purify the mind chitta shuddhi so bhagwan's instruction second chapter is nitya sattvasto bhava 
our life should be such that mind should acquire sattvic qualities that is the way the way of living should be that is what bhagwan says then what will happen then your higher sadhana becomes easier a sattvic mind is a cooperating mind in higher sadhana so what is the highest sadhana to be done disidentify from the bmi identify with consciousness this is the highest sadhana to be done so what does bhagwan say nanyam gune bhyakartaram yada drashta anupashyati verse number 19 nanyam gune bhyakartaram yada drashta anupashyati then gune bhyasya param veti what is that mad bhavam sodhi gachati yes gune bhyasya param veti mad bhavam sodhi gachati so what happens at that sattvic state when we sit for meditation with a sattvic mind nanyam gune bhyakartaram yada drashta now that term is very important yada drashta anupashyati so at the seat of meditation you are supposed to be a drashta a witness so i at the seat of meditation i am witnessing my thoughts drashta now this witnessing is not possible by a rajasic mind it is not possible by a tamasic mind what happens when we witness our thoughts with a rajasic mind you will not be able to witness the thoughts you will get carried away by the thoughts this is what happens this is called as vikshepa wandering mind to witness the thought you must have detachment from the thoughts what is the nature of a rajasic mind it is filled with raga dvesha raga is also sticking dvesha is also sticking so when you go to watch the thoughts you get stuck in the thoughts <laughs> it's a sticker ragatmaka mind is a sticker mind it sticks so instead of being a drashta you become a bhokta you can't witness witness needs detachment that is not possible so that's why we say rajasic mind is unfit for higher meditation what about a tamasic mind can it do what you call witnessing the moment it gets into witnessing it sleeps off uh he becomes a sleeper all right when we say drashta there is knowing and there is also a state of being alert you have to be alert and knowing that state is called drashta bhava there is alertness and there is there is watching knowing being aware so the alertness is the nature of a sattvic mind knowing is the nature of a sattvic mind so only a sattvic mind can be actually a drashta so then what happens in that state you are watching the thoughts and a great truth is revealed at the seat of meditation what is that na anyam gune bhyakartaram this doer is none other than the gunas the thoughts which i am seeing is different from me the drashta the witness all these thoughts are nothing but gunas nothing but the mind i am not the mind i am the witness of the mind i am the observer of the mind gunebhyascha param veti i find myself as param higher than different from the gunas remember guna means mind mind means thoughts i am different from my thoughts 
all these thoughts which i am seeing they are all drishya vastu i am drashta a great revelation happens you see a distance from yourself and your thoughts what happens when we don't meditate this distance is not seen this difference is not seen this separation is not seen i think that i am my thoughts but what happens with this meditation with a satvik mind gunebhyascha param veti i clearly see that this gunas i am not i am the drashta different from gunas and suddenly bhagwan says mad bhavam sodhi gachati this witness who is he bhagwan says it is mad bhavam it is my nature means what it is me <laughs> so what is it aham brahma asmi i very clearly see that i the witness bhagwan says that that witness is me aham atma guda kesha so who is god very clearly bhagwan says this drashta in you is god this observer is god that is mad bhava that is my true nature so this is a sadhana to be done witnessing the highest state the highest state of meditation so as i have told you this chapter is a very sadhana oriented chapter so we will have to meditate remember in spirituality knowledge is always experiential in nature any knowing is not theoretical any knowing is experiential so when can i say i know my tamasic mind <laughs> when i have experienced the tamasic mind i say i know it when i have experienced the rajasic mind i say i know it when i have experienced satvic mind i say i know it so knowing and experiencing both are synonymous in spirituality we don't give any value to information which we gain by reading books so this chapter is a chapter asking us to experience what is happening in the mind what are the different moods of the mind experience it go through it and know it right so when we look within we find all this whatever is said in 14 chapter we clearly find that all these things are there in me all right so here one more point we have to keep in mind these three moods are there and these three moods can be intensified through our sadhana sattva can be intensified so what happens is slowly when we know this our whole life becomes very sadhana oriented we become very careful that mind is exposed to good samskaras and the importance of that also we realize now here are another aspect which we would like to discuss is can we go from tamas now let us assume that i understand that my mind is in tamas i want the mind to be in sattva is it possible to go from tamas to sattva is it possible now see these are the questions which are very practical and useful so we have to understand it is not possible to directly go from tamas to sattva what is the way tamas to rajas rajas to sattva this is the way remember the pole vault example so this pole is the mind so this pole vaulter he climbs the pole so this climbing the pole is nothing but elevating the mind from tamas to rajas rajas to sattva that is called climbing the pole and finally he has to drop the pole so dropping the pole is dropping the mind and this dropping the mind is nothing but witnessing the mind which is mentioned in the 19th verse drashta you have to become so being the drashta is nothing but dropping the pole and then you go to the other side so make use of the mind then drop the mind this is the way of sadhana 
प्यूरीफाइ द माइंड ड्रॉप द माइंड दिस इज द वे directly dropping the mind is not possible just like directly dropping the pole is not the way you have to climb the pole and then drop the pole in the same way in this climbing also you can't climb from directly onto the top <laughs> you have to start from bottom only there is a way there is a gradual way isn't it a climbing process in is involved in the same way from tamas if you find that mind is mostly in tamas then don't try to meditate too much it's of no use you will sleep only so if you find too much of tamas is there get into rajasic mood at the seat of mind at the seat of meditation you can't become rajasic <laughs> then what is the way so bhagwan ravana maharshi upadesh sara says pranayama is the way hmm? pranayama is a rajasic means it's an energizer prana is born out of rajasic aspect of the pancha mahabhutas if you study tattva bodha you know so because it is made of rajasic aspect to increase the rajas in you when you are tamasic best is pranayam the best the beauty of pranayama is it also makes the mind quiet see there are very many rajasic practices which makes the mind disturbed but the beauty of pranayama is if the prana is slow steady regulated it not only takes you to the rajasic state it also paves the way towards the sattvic state hmm. that is the beauty of pranayama it takes you to sattva through rajas without disturbing you vayu rodhanat liyate manah jal pakshivat so the mind becomes fresh with pranayam that's why bhagwan shankaracharya also says pranayamam pratyaharam nitya nitya viveka vichar so this is a very practical tip at the seat of meditation if you are feeling sleepy etc pranayama can help so this is the way so what does bhagwan say in the end bhagwan says bhakti is the way it is through bhakti that a person can attain the state of gunatita it is with bhakti that you can make the mind satvik and it is with bhakti alone that you can drop the mind also everything is possible with bhakti so bhagwan emphasizes on bhakti to grow in our spiritual path so this is the essence of the 14th chapter bondage is through the mind so therefore if you want liberation purify the mind drop the mind and the means is devotion Yes if you have any questions you may ask on this Aryam Samji uh, we will complete this uh, questions and if you have time then we will go into that Okay okay Unna ji Swami ji thank you so much for that beautiful uh, interpretation and as usual all your practical examples um swami ji uh, the next part of uh, uh, today's session we would also want to know um, a little bit uh, from you about uh, upadesha saram recently we've started uh, studying upadesha saram so what can you know we expect our sadhakas from the street ties and what is the uniqueness of the street ties according to you in the question what i understand was there was a confusion regarding the introduction of vadesha sara <laughs> mm. that i can understand because suddenly the first verse is criticizing action karma kim param karma tajjadam mm. why bhagwan ramana maharshi is so annoyed with karma so see we have to understand one thing where are we stuck as a what to call as a great teacher mm. as a master teacher bhagwan ramana maharshi is first pointing out where we are stuck in life where are we stuck bhagwan says we are stuck in action in understanding the nature of action in giving too much of importance to action in life you will find we all have given too much of importance to action and this is the reason we are in bondage we have 
कंसिडर कर्मा एस परम फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू विल ऑलवेज फाइंड दिस डिस्कशन यू नो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू अचीव एनी थिंग वर्क हार्ड टू दिस टू दैट एक्सेप्ट वेर इज एम्फसाइज कर्मा इज एम्फसाइज इवन द सो कॉल्ड स्पिरिचुअल पीपल ऑल्सो धार्मिक पीपल ऑल्सो दे ऑल्सो गिव इंपॉर्टेंस टू कर्मा ओनली so there is one verse which says i think some ashtadasha purana nam among all the 18 puranas what is the essence paropakaram punnyaya paapaya parapeedanam this is the essence of all the 18 so where is the focus now focus is again on action only <laughs> karma theory is a focus do punnya everything good will happen to you do paapa you will suffer do only good do good be good again focus is on action only this is called as karma param as though you if if you have understood this do good be good then you have understood everything bhagwan ramana maharshi says no this alone is not there is one step higher also so what is bhagwan ramana maharshi doing he is analyzing what is action is there something higher than action bhagwan says yes what is higher than action bhagwan says to perform this action there are so many factors involved and the greatest factor is bhagwan himself in any action that ability to act in us it comes from the lord the instruments become sentient because of the lord this action is able to give results because of the lord karturajnaya prapyate phalam any action is performed it gives result who is giving result the result giver alone is supreme the one who is making us capable of performing action alone is supreme you see so action is not supreme the one who is giving us a conducive environment because of which action is possible that infinite intelligence alone can be supreme not karma so if your whole life is focused only on karma and not on paramatma then you are going to be bound kruti mahaudadhau patana karanam phalam ashashvatam gati nirodhakam this is what will happen to a person who focuses only on karma only on action hmm? right kruti mahodhadhau patana karana he will enter into an ocean of action why is it so phalam ashashvatam because every action can every action is finite so it can give you only finite results finite results cannot make us happy so therefore you will you will go on performing action because it is continuously giving finite results. so this action life after life life after life this is called as kruti maha udadhi ocean of action and this person is fallen patana karana what is fallen means what taking a body and coming back to this world this is called fall he is not able to come out he is not able to realize his infinite nature he is stuck in his finite bmi coming back again and again this is called gati nirodhakam you are stuck your forward progress is stuck you are not spiritually evolving you are stuck in a bmi surrounded by you you become a pft again and again with the bmi exposed by the oet there is no progress there is no progress means what mind is not becoming satvik you are bound that bondage remains permanently all right this is what happens to a person who focuses only on action and the society will find this is true with 99.99% also we are stuck in action we crave for the results of action we believe that i am the performer of action that 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 uh, what you call that notion itself is a wrong notion that i am the doer right 
so therefore in the beginning itself bhagwan ravana maharshi criticizes this wrong notion action is not supreme karma kim param karma ta jadam action all all elements connected to action they are all jadam inert body is inert mind is inert intellect is inert the world is inert everything is inert then who is making us capable of performing action there is a sentient entity who is called as god turn your attention to that sentient entity in you which is making you capable of performing action be grateful to him be humble give all the credits to him don't take any credit if you take the credit you are giving the credit to the ego actually speaking ego is a non existent entity which should not be given any credit for the good action you perform but if you take credit what will happen kruti mahav dadhau patana karanam will happen you have a choice you can do some punya karma and you can take all the credit for yourself this is one choice or you can give all the credit to god this is another choice exercise this choice and your destiny is sealed <laughs> if you take the credit for yourself it simply means you are postponing your liberation if you take all credit for yourself you are postponing your liberation but if you give the credit to the lord ishwararpitam nechaya krutam chittashodhakam mukti sadhakam ishwararpitam when actions are performed with this knowledge that this ability belongs to bhagwan instruments belong to bhagwan this sentience in me belongs to bhagwan the results also are given by bhagwan everything therefore belongs to bhagwan if with this attitude if you perform action then what will happen chitta shodhakam will happen mind will become pure and in such a pure mind see chitta shuddhi what is that satvik mind of 14th chapter mukti sadhakam it will help you attain mukti liberation so we are all stuck in this action only action is the cause of bondage what does bhagavad gita say yatnyarthat karmano nyatra lokoyam karma bandhana tadartham karma kaunteya mukta sanga samachara with yatnya bhava when you do actions it liberates you yatnya bhava means what attitude of sacrifice you are giving credit to the lord to whom alone all credit should go i am performing action because of your grace bhagwan the results also come because of your grace give all credit to the lord you are free take all credit you are bound this is how upadesh sara starts so where are we stuck we are stuck in action now bhagwan goes on to explain the three different sadhanas very important sadhana what are they puja japa and chintana puja japa dhyana three important sadhanas kramat uttamam it is said bhojanam japa chintanam kramat so compared to puja japa is higher compared to japa dhyana is a higher so in puja you have your body your speech your mind three supports are there in japa only speech and mind two supports in dhyana only mind only one support is there so bhagwan says lesser the support the higher the sadhana so then the description is given what is puja serving the world with the attitude of serving the lord is puja jagata ishadhi yukta sevanam mashta murti bhrut deva poojanam serve the world this is where we have to begin serve the world serve the world with the feeling that i am serving bhagwan himself because bhagwan is ashta murti bhrut the whole world is not nothing but the manifestation of the lord serve everyone beautifully well that will create purity in mind then about japa so 
స్తవనం ఉచ్చజప మందజప చిత్తజం జప కేటగిరీస్ ఆర్ గివన్ వన్ ఈస్ స్తోత్రం చాంటింగ్ భగవాన్ సేజ్ హయర్ దాన్ దాట్ ఈస్ ఉచ్చజప లౌడ్ చాంటింగ్ హయర్ దాన్ దాట్ ఈస్ మందజప విస్పరింగ్ అండ్ హయర్ దాన్ దాట్ ఈస్ చిత్తజం జప మెంటలీ చాంటింగ్ ద నేమ్ ఆఫ్ ద లాడ్ రైట్ సో దిస్ ఈస్ అబౌట్ జప దెన్ కమ్స్ ధ్యాన ఇన్ ధ్యాన సరళ చింతనం అండ్ విరళ చింతనం టూ కేటగిరీస్ ఆర్ మేడ్ a meditation which is uninterrupted steady like the flow ajya dharaya srota sasam like the flow of ghee that is sarala chintanam so uninterrupted meditation is superior to interrupted one again meditation is categorized into two what is that meditation on the lord who is separate from me another one meditation upon the lord who is one with me dvaita bhavana and advaita bhavana bhagavan says advaita is again superior so this way these classifications are given and next the topic taken up is about pranayama bhagavan says this pranayama helps a lot in quieting the mind but this quieted mind is not sufficient what is the problem the problem is the moment you stop pranayama the mind is again disturbed so it is not a permanent solution the what is a permanent solution eka chintanam is unavoidable meditation upon the self is unavoidable bhagwan how to do meditation upon the self so bhagwan says withdraw your attention from the world and fix it upon the self in you and then comes manasam dukham margane krute naiva manasam marga arjavat when you enter into the nature of the mind the mind disappears this is called as straight forward method then bhagwan says this aham vritti should be destroyed only then it is real sadhana mere vritti is getting destroyed will not do vrittayastvam vritti maashritah వృత్తయో మనో విద్ధి అహం మన వన్స్ అహం వృత్తి ఇస్ డిస్ట్రాయిడ్ ద ట్రూ అహం షైన్స్ ఫోర్ అహమయం కుతో భవతి చిన్మత ఐపతత్యహం నిజ విచారణ ద రియల్ సాధన ఈస్ ద ఈగోయిస్టిక్ ఐ షుడ్ గో దెన్ ద రియల్ ఐ షైన్స్ ఫోర్ యాజ్ సచ్చిత్ ఆనంద్ then bhagwan says what is it next topic is taken up dvaita and advaita so bhagwan again very clearly says that there is no difference between jeevatma and paramatma both are one and the same they are nothing but consciousness alone so this is the way upadesara goes and finally bhagwan says aham apetakam నిజ విభానకం మహత్ ఇదం తపో రమణ వాక్యం వాట్ ఈస్ ద గ్రేటెస్ట్ తపస్ ఏ స్పిరిచువల్ పర్సన్ కెన్ డూ అహం అపేతకం ద ఈగో మస్ట్ డ్రాప్ నిజ విభానకం ద సెల్ఫ్ మస్ట్ షైన్ ఫోర్త్ ఇఫ్ దిస్ మచ్ వీ కెన్ డూ దెన్ దట్ ఈస్ ద గ్రేటెస్ట్ తపస్ ఏ పర్సన్ కెన్ డూ ఇన్ లైఫ్ కిల్ దిస్ ఈగో అండ్ అలౌ ద సెల్ఫ్ టు షైన్ ఫోర్త్ ఇఫ్ దిస్ ఈస్ డన్ యు ఆర్ డూయింగ్ ద రైట్ సాధన ఇన్ లైఫ్ so this is what is the whole of upadesha so where should we start from don't give importance to action give importance to the lord who is making us capable of performing all action shift your attention to bhagwan alone this is where you have to make the change never take any credit for all the good things that we do give all the credit to the lord it should not be a mere lip service many times that is also there all because of god's grace guru's grace this but deep down i know with my effort only i have attained <laughs> okay from the depth of your heart it should come no bhagwan 100% credit should go to you but the one normal question is, no no but i only struggled no i only suffered no how can i say god did it i only did no 
okay baba you struggled but for that inspiration was there who gave you that inspiration how did you create the inspiration to work hard to focus to concentrate hmm? that source of inspiration is unknown see once you are inspired anything can be done but from where that inspiration comes that you will have to give credit to god only so that is why god alone has to given has to be given full credit so this 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 knowledge must come from the depth of our heart this conviction hmm. only then you become a true karma yogi okay so i think i have answered if any question is there we can see later ah yes next one and the, 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 now we've entered into the question session only swami ji uh, ah. so i love uh, and um, ajit ji has taken the onus for all of us so he is the one who is putting all of our questions into his words ah. uh, so i'll begin with a question from him um based on upadesha saram itself ah. uh, so uh, ajit ji's question is based on verse 4 kaya vagmana karyam uttamam poojanam japas chintanam kramat so ajit ji says um, verse 4 details that japa is superior to pooja and contemplation contemplation is superior to japa uh, contemplation or chintanam being subtle is more difficult because it is nirguna nirakara dhyana without any name or form so even in chapter 12 bhagwan has indicated that worship of the formless is indeed very challenging so for beginners like us is murti puja the only way to reach there or is there any other way swami ji will appreciate your pearls of wisdom on the same see lower sadhana i am not interested in higher sadhana i am not capable of <laughs> what you are planning to do then lower sadhana i don't want to do i have no interest higher sadhana i can't do please remember one thing you have to start from the gross to move towards the subtle there is no other way everybody has to start from the basics only then he can go to the advanced in every field higher thing you cannot do unless you are a master of the lower so you say is there any other way murti puja fine i can give you some other ways also for example the buddhist people what will they do they sit and observe their breath watch the breath going in going out going in going out because this is the grossest thing that is happening in your body no is no no i am not interested in that all is very boring thing you know just watching the breath going in going out what is this <laughs> so when a simple sadhana is given you are bored when a higher sadhana is given you are not capable of doing then where do you plan to start so therefore the only suggestion we can give is somewhere you have to create interest in the lower you have to create interest how to create interest is left up to you some people start with hatha yoga also that is also fine doing yoga yoga asanas because controlling the body is easy so they do yoga yoga asanas etc so consciously you are aware of the movement of the body this is a very gross thing so in the process your health is also improved very good but your what you call sensitivity also improves of what is happening inside so at a very low level i am not capable of knowing what is happening in the mind so let me try to be aware of what is happening at the body level you see the whole of spirituality is being aware if i am not able to be aware of the subtle happenings in me let me start from being aware of the grosser happening in me the grossest part of my personality is the body 
So let me be aware of the movement of this body. This is what yoga is. Hatha yoga. So I move my limbs. In the process, of course, the limbs become flexible, healthy, etc. But more importantly, I focus, I pay attention, I become aware of the movement of the limbs. Right. Then comes asana. The next one is pranayama. In the Ashtanga Yoga, starting with asana only. Next is pranayama. What is pranayama? Body is not moving, only breath is moving. So breath is subtler than the physical body. Prana is subtler than the sthula sharira. Then you observe the breath. Be aware, be aware, be aware, be aware. As you become more and more aware, then you become qualified to be aware of the moods of the mind. Be aware of the different emotions. Be aware of the different thoughts. You see, so you are raising your level of awareness, ability to be aware. You are becoming more and more sensitive. What I am trying to say is somewhere at the lower level you have to start. Either start from yoga or start from Murti Puja. Murti Puja is a beautiful technique. In the beginning it may be very boring and you may not have interest etc. But it is very helpful. Do it for one month. Do it with a lot of feelings. You know. Murti Puja, feeling that Bhagwan is in front of you, that infinite Lord is available for you. He is receiving all little, little things you do. You know, you wash his feet and Bhagwan is available. He is accepting. You are feeding him. You are talking to him. You are bathing him and all those things. Shoda Shopachara Puja. With a simple, pure heart, when you just try to build a relationship with God, slowly, slowly what happens is, people who have do, done it, they say this, that a time comes when you are so attached to this puja, that when you don't do puja a particular day, you become miserable. You feel that that day you have not met God, you know. Every day you spend some time with God, and that particular day when you have not done puja, you have not, you not spent time with the most important person in this world. So in the beginning you will not understand what, but slowly, slowly. So that is why so many Rishi Munis and have all emphasized on puja. But as I said, there are other ways also. It's not necessary that you must know Murti Puja like Buddhists. They are also evolving spiritually. But there is an equally boring thing, <laughs> you know, observing the breath and all that. So you will have to find out your way. I, I don't say that only Murti Puja can take you there. I would not say that. But somewhere you have to begin from LKG. It can be maybe yoga or it can be maybe something else. It can be service also. I don't deny that. Service, when some people are suffering. So you do some kind of service. Tana, mana, dhana. Spend some time in selfless service. That is also gross and that also is very, you know. So you will have to find your inclination, which one is better. Seva is also accepted. Puja is also accepted. Murti Puja is not a must. I will not say that. Because there are so many great spiritual people who have not done any Murti Puja. Different culture has got different, different ways of you will have to find your way. I hope I have answered Ajiji. Uh, Swamiji Pranavam. Yes, very much. As usual. Thank you. Right. Swamiji, the next uh, question uh, from Ajiji is uh, from the Gita, from the, with the reference to chapter 14. He says that uh, Bhagavad Gita, scriptures, sages, gurus, they've left no stone unturned in explaining the path of karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga and other requisites like shravanam, mananam, nitidyasanam. And in chapter 14 also, uh, which details about the play of the gunas influencing our mind and how these gunas can be transcended. Having said that, 
there are only a rare few who reach the lotus feet of the lord or gain moksha so for the bulk of humanity including us what are the impediments then is it because of our prarabdha is it because of our lack of spiritual evolution or a lack of effort in the various paths mentioned about what are the impediments that are not letting us progress in our spiritual journey see many times we discuss that world is a not world is not the source of happiness god is the source of happiness but tell me how true we are when we make this statement deep down we are all finding happiness in the world only yes or no <laughs> when people respect us love us when we are with the near and dear ones we are happy when we have lot of money we are happy when we have good health we are happy so do externally we may say world is not the source of happiness deep down our conviction is world only is the source of happiness yes or no as long as our deepest conviction is that world is the source of happiness spiritual progress will not happen so when you are asking for spiritual progress what will god do he has no other choice but to give you suffering because suffering is the only way in which it will be proved to you that world is not the source of happiness are you ready for it <laughs> see Bhagwan, give me nyana bhakti vairagya. Bhagwan says, "I am going to give you suffering. Are you ready?" No, no, Bhagwan, without making me suffer, give me nyana bhakti vairagya. Bhagwan has no choice because vairagya means disinterest in the world. Correct. As long as you are deriving joy from the world, how can you be disinterested in the world? when pain from the world comes you will be disinterested but pain you don't want <laughs> then suddenly you start hating god only when he starts giving you pain and he has no other way but to give you pain you understood where we are stuck i want to progress spirituality but i don't want worldly pain but worldly pain is the only way in which vairagya can be developed you see so let us be very clear world is a what you call miserable place how will you know this this is called intense mumukshutvam remember the qualification for liberation world is a miserable place how will i know when i go through misery it can be humiliation it can be intense sickness disease death all kinds of bad things when it happens to me then i come to know yes world is indeed a source of misery just imagine the examples given a person jata is burning that is a kind of example given for you know tivra mumukshutva so such suffering when it comes what is the natural thing this person will do in fact the only thing which will the he will turn to god and when you turn to god there is peace because peace is his nature right so the value of god is understood only when there is misery in the world otherwise we will not whole heartedly turn to god just like a hungry person will not seek food i mean just like a person without hunger will not seek food only a very very hungry person will seek food in the same way only a person who has become miserable in the world in the worldly suffering only such a person will sincerely single heartedly whole heartedly see god so bhagwan has no choice but to give suffering are you ready for it <laughs> don't worry bhagwan will not ask you when he finds that you are fit he will give you without even asking you 
okay and when that suffering comes your spiritual progress will skyrocket <laughs> it will not be crawling it will be rocketing <laughs> and this only you will know others will not know others will criticize you humiliate you disregard you ignore you but you from within you know that you are in love for god is really really becoming strong because the whole world has abandoned you but not god when the whole world has abandoned you you also shift your attention from the world you are miserable so in that misery you hold on to god and when you hold on to god you experience intense ananda then you come to know really my friend is bhagwan alone not my near and dear ones then you understand the value of the lord his presence you experience relationship become intimate love becomes intense but all this happen what is the first condition <laughs> suffering from the world kicks from the world <laughs> the world has to kick you then you go with him isn't it so don't worry when the right time comes we'll all be kicked properly okay but then understand that bhagwan has no other choice that is why he is doing all this hmm? unless there is suffering outside we will never go inside but all these studies will help immediately we know oh there is a way so then we go in so the study is just to prepare ourselves for all the future sufferings hmm. right ajit ji answered have you sorry ji yes 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 more than answer <laughs> swami ji the next question is again from the geeta this is from suresh ji um we had uh, recently studied how bhagwan uh, talks about avyabicharini bhakti as a means of transcending the gunas so can you please explain this this uh, term and the concept see this is a very strong term used by bhagwan vyabhichara in every aspect of life when there is a clear understanding that god alone is behind that that is called as avyabhichara vyabhichara means deviation for example my existence whom do i owe to so if you say yes i am owing because you know oxygen is there food is there then that becomes vyabhichara i am existing only because of god now that is avyabhichara i am existing because of so many factors then that is vibhichara hmm. when our thinking is very superficial then vibhichara happens why am i alive on this planet because of gravitation because of food because of water because of clothing this that etc you find that there are so many reasons why you are existing then you give importance to all those factors and when you are giving importance to so many other factors naturally the importance which should be have been given to god decreases gets diluted so then we say it is vyabhichara what should be my answer it is because of the lord that i am existing then that is avyabhichara so with respect to existence second is as we have discussed with respect to action i am able to perform action in the world who is responsible no i am eating good food body is healthy therefore i am performing action ye bichara has started the answer is bhagwan alone it is because of the lord that i am performing action this body is kept alive by the lord alone not by my breathing inhalation exhalation no na pranena na apanena mrityo jeevati kashana itarena tu jeevanti you see don't get stuck with the superficial factors go to the deep go to that ultimate factor so with respect to performance of action also 
Why am I performing action? The answer should be to please the Lord. That is avya bichar. But if I say no, no, to fulfill my desire, that is why I am performing action. Then again, it is vibhichara only. I have my own hidden agenda <laughs> to fulfill my desire. If I am performing action, then that is vibhichara. To fulfill his desires, I am performing action. That is avya bichar. So when we say avya bichar ni bhakti in every aspect of life, it has to be seen. You know. Now while performing action, I have problems. Whom are you turning to? I am turning to this richest politician here. He can help me with power, money, etc. That becomes a vichara. I am turning to my near and dear ones. A vichara. When I have problems in life, whom am I turning to? I am turning to God. That is a vichara. Right. When I am highly disturbed. I go to a mall and see some film and try to relax. What is it? Avya bichara. When I have lost my peace, what should I do? I should go to Bhagawan and seek consolation, seek peace, seek strength, seek courage. Right. Every time I am using some other source for my peace, strength, courage, etc., it is avya bichara. I mean, it is vyabhichar. For everything, I turn to God. I live for God. My intention is to please God. Right. So this is while performing action. While getting the results from God. What should be my attitude? These results are coming from God. I will not say because of this person I got it, because of that person I got. No, that is Vebi Charavim. Whatever I am getting, I am getting it from God. Then that is a Vebi Charavim. Externally, you may see some people, you know, giving you the result. They are all superficial factors, insignificant factors. The real factor who gives you result is Bhagavan. And this hidden hand of God you are seeing in everything in your life. In every happening of your life. So if you are able to see this hidden hand of God, then that is avyabhichar. So this is called as avyabhicharani bhakti. When you have problems, you are turning to God. When you are performing action, you are giving all credit to God. For your own existence, you give all credit to God alone. So everything is happening because of God and God alone. This is called avyabhicharani bhakti. Unwavering. Nobody is important except God. This is called as unwavering. There is only one entity which is important and that is God alone. Not even 0.00001% anybody is fit to take credit for anything that is happening in your life. That is called as Avvipicharani Bhakti. Single pointed, pure, undiluted, focused. All right. So, you are loving your parents, but those parents are also manifestation of God. Bhagavan's love is fully flowing through them. So therefore I love my parents. Not because they have taken care of me. No. It is Bhagavan who took care of me through these instruments of father and mother. So where is the focus now? Externally you are serving your parents but internally your attention is to please the Lord who has sent these instruments in taking care of you. So the parents are also happy and internally there is Abhya Bicharani Bhakti also. You see? So in every aspect, this has to be there. Every aspect. Vibhichara is not allowed. The moment you give importance to anything in your life other than God, Vibhichara has happened. So how do we experience Vibhichara? At the seat of meditation, mental wandering is the expression of Vibhichara. Why is my mind wandering? 
mind is wandering because it is giving importance to something else more than god the moment mind give importance to anything other than god the mind will wander into that entity a thing being or a situation vastu vyakti paristhiti it can be anything so expression of vyabichara is a wandering mind this is a symptom of vyabichara right. to the extent you ignore god in your life to that extent you will find that you can't control your mind wandering mind becomes natural you get carried away by the mind this is the price we pay for ignoring the lord what happens to a person where there is agya vicharani bhakti mind is rooted in the self there is no wandering because the most important person in my life is right here in my heart as a very self so why should i want it right so expression of vibhichara is a wandering my vikshepa that's the expression of a hrajsthale mana swasthata kriya bhakti yoga bodhascha nischitam bhakti yoga bodhascha nischitam all paths what is the culmination hrasthale manah swasthata firm abidance of the mind in the self is the end result of all paths what is this firm abidance it is the expression of avya vicharani bhakti i have nowhere to go the lotus feet of the lord is right in my heart i remain here this way that when the mind remains in the self that is the expression of avya vicharani bhakti right a silent mind cheerful mind content mind non wandering mind these are all the expressions suraj ji did i answer yes swami ji so the beautiful connection between karma yoga and bhakti yoga is coming yes yes swami ji the next question is also suresh ji yesterday we were disc- we were studying verse 27 hmm. so in that shashvatasya cha dharmasya we were discussing so i think um, there is one more question no some nine or something yeah i left it to the last spiritual okay. tria okay fine fine nine okay. and multiples of nine <laughs> oh. hmm. uh so the um Gita question. The last question is about this Shashvata Dharma. Can you Haan. kindly elaborate on Shashvata Dharma? See the beauty of Sanskrit is, especially some terms are there. Different meanings are there for that term. So one meaning of Dharma is teaching. Shashvata Dharma, that teaching which is eternal, which is valid all the time, which can never become obsolete, outdated. shashvata dharma so it is an eternal teaching the same teaching was given in satyuga also it is equally valid in kaliyuga also in all yugas so this is one meaning it's a beautiful meaning right a teaching which is always valid another meaning of dharma is peace and harmony right dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge to establish the peace and harmony in the society i take birth bhagwan says so shashvata dharma that which gives eternal peace and harmony in the society that is bhagwan turning to whom there is peace and harmony in the society that meaning also is beautiful shashvata dharma also can mean eternal values of life dharma another meaning is values of life humility straight forwardness compassion forgiveness they are all values and they are eternally valid these are values in all yugas they are equally valid they also can, can never become obsolete so values of life also can be dharma shashvata dharma 
dharma also mean duty so what is our shashwata dharma eternal duty <laughs> our eternal duty is to turn to god this is our greatest duty this is the duty of every one of us dharma also can mean our nature so shashwata dharma what is our eternal nature nashwara dharma is the body shashwata dharma is consciousness consciousness is our nature so what is the definition of nature that without which a thing cannot exist is called nature dharma of a thing heat is a dharma of fire sweetness is a dharma of sugar that without which a thing cannot exist in the same way if this is a definition what is that without which we cannot exist so we say it is a self it is a consciousness right and that is shashwata dharma it is our eternal nature permanent nature so shashwata dharma se pratishtha aham i am the pratishtha refuse to all this so this way all these meanings are valid here different different meanings of dharma shashwata dharma clear yes, samaji samaji before going to the next question yesterday's hmm. discussion we had come up with one uh pro point this brahm brahmano hi pratishta aham ha aham how bhagavan can give a uh, pratishta for a brahman brahman doesn't required any support ha so there the meaning is aham brahmasmi <laughs> it is not brahman is there and there is another pratishta which is giving you know support for brahman no 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 i am that brahman so all those terms it is bhagwan himself i am the support means what for that term i am the support <laughs> that word brahman has become meaningful because i am there the name has got a pratishtha a support because of me that way we can say Urna, the last question. The last is some spiritual trivia question from Ajit Ji about the number nine and its multiples. Uh, Swami Ji, is there uh, really any significance to it? Is it true about nine, eighteen, and hundred and eight? See, now I am going to give you my person. What do you call my personal opinion and understanding? According to me. there is no importance for any number what is the most important thing most important thing is you know there is nothing called lucky number unlucky number and all karma theory is very clear if you have done good the no unlucky number can take away the blessings of that good action and if you are bad no lucky number can bless you and protect you from that bad influence everything is right if you talk about the importance of number now you have given navaratna and this and that that way i can give lot of things for any number three let us say trimurti is there then what uh avasthatraya is there gunatraya is there they are all three only triputi is there isn't it three netra is there three eyes so many things are three basically they say there are only three colors from which all the other colors have come so three can have so many take four so many are there sadhana chatushtaya sampatti is there hmm? ashramas are divided into four varnas are divided into four jatis are also brahmana kshatriya vaishya shudra jatis are four yugas are into four brahma has got four heads yes or no again you will find there are so many chatur 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 pancha you take pancha jnanendriyas pancha karmendriyas pancha mahabhutas how many panchas are there so this for every number has got something or the other <laughs> Right, so that is not a valid. This is, but yes, there is a belief that 
9 is a very auspicious number that is only a belief please understand if you believe in something you start seeing that thing this is a law of this universe if you strongly believe in something what happens is the mind starts seeing only according to its beliefs this is this is a great law a psychology which we have to understand suppose you believe a black cat has crossed my road so today lot of inauspicious things are going to happen suppose this firm belief is there in you okay early morning you are walking i i hope you know this <laughs> black cat crossing and all so that early morning you are going somewhere and the black cat is crossing and suddenly you know because your faith is strong your mind cannot forget it that particular incident it's a, it's a very silly incident but you have taken it seriously now what happens to the mind mind is now tuned to everything negative that is going to happen on that day isn't it just like you tune the radio and that particular wavelength that frequency you tune to and then you that song is right here in the same way now what is the mind tuned to everything negative that is going to happen that day. so naturally you will find so many negative things in fact the negative things are there in every day negative things are there positive things are there but that particular day now the mind is focusing only filtering in only the negative things and you say see dekha morning that happened and now everything negative is happening it's not that only negative things are happening you are seeing only negative things because the mind is tuned only to negative things positive things are happening but your mind is not tuned therefore you don't see just like a rag picker sees only the bottles and plastic covers etc even in the cleanest city why the mind is tuned to bottles and plastics <laughs> there are so many beautiful things he is not seeing it because well, the mind is tuned only in the same way a mind which is filled with all kinds of superstition is tuned to a particular thing and it filters in and therefore sees only such thing understand this psychology okay so all these are mere superstitions but you will see results because your mind is tuned to seeing results really speaking numbers have no importance yes this law is very important beware of your thoughts because they become your they become your words words become actions habits personality destiny yes this law i believe in everything in your life is happening based on your thoughts your actions etc this is based on karma theory otherwise this numbers etc has got personally i am not attached to any number this 13 is a very what you call inauspicious number etc in my life i have never found 13 to be a very inauspicious because i don't believe in it <laughs> you see what you believe in this is a law श्रद्धामयोयम पुरुषः यो यत् श्रद्धस एव सह भगवान सेस ए मैन इज नथिंग बट ए बंडल ऑफ हिज बिलीव्स इज नथिंग बट ए बंडल ऑफ हिज बिलीव्स सो इफ यू बिलीव देन यू विल सी देयर इज या 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 इट इज ट्रू सो यू नो दिस 13 इज अ वेरी बैड नंबर बिकॉज़ व्हेन आई वाज गिवन अ 13 रूम नंबर इन अ होटल सच एंड सच थिंग्स हैपेंड a spiritual person should not have any attachment or aversion to any number because it is illogical that is called a superstition which has no basis now this is my personal opinion you have the freedom to choose any number i remember a beautiful answer given by shri shri our ravi shankar okay he was born on 13th may 13th may he was born you know what he said this is such an auspicious number and auspicious month you know what he said may 13 how will you say in hindi may tera <laughs> i am yours <laughs> so the way of looking at it may tera you see 
he gave an auspicious meaning to the so called inauspicious number this is the way you see when the mind is filled with positivity you translate everything as positive you redefine things as positive this is what i believe in so amiji with that we've come to the end of our sessions thank you so much for uh, clarifying all our doubts so lucidly and for adding an extra dimension to our understanding so much thank you pranam i think amma has some question dipali yeah. amma i just saw her uh, raising her hand say that about the 13 number from that also i want to say that my grandchild <laughs> 13 number so she was also asking everybody you see everybody says i am unlucky because it is 13 so didan what is your opinion i said lucky for someone you just why you are thinking thinking it is 13 you can think it is four, four only three plus one is four and you are my didan so you are lucky so that's <laughs> what you have to do is go to this google and found mm. find out all great people born yeah. on 13th yeah that also i say so many people ah this is the way you have to born. inspire that yeah. child you know yes. never allow the child to become very negative and all that pessimistic and all that. Ah. i think i yesterday because of internet i could not last our means 14th chapter mm. last verse amrita mm. sha सपोर्ट मीन्स एवरीथिंग इज कमिंग फ्रॉम मी आई एम द बेसिस फॉर एवरीथिंग in short bhagwan is all in all if you have understood this you have understood this well bhagwan there is nothing other than the lord haryom haryom to all swami ji uh, as usual we are so much grateful to you for explaining such high philosophical uh, definitions in such a simple language and using so many uh, natural experiences which we are used to so that all this knowledge will go easily into our understanding and as you rightly said putting them into practice depends upon every one of us and uh, in today's class you have given us a summary of chapter 14 then you had uh, given the example of pole vaulting from tamasic to satvik through rajasik and uh, you had also said uh, what all ways we can come out of getting stuck with karma and proceed only to the ultimate and almost at the end uh, about the numbers you said do not get stuck with things which are not important and uh, spirituality you mentioned now spirituality you will not go along with illogical beliefs or things and what we remember is that swami ji when you said about bhakti we remember acharya bhagavad pada's particular explanation is that jnana purviga bhakti which we had uh, studied in while we were uh, learning this chapter and um, gurudev also particularly he used in his commentaries always it has to be rational and analytical and your usage of the word illogical has put further uh, light on to that one and the final one swami ji about sri sri ravi shankar <laughs> me tera <laughs> is wonderful and uh, i think uh, shri shri ravi shankar was in dubai yesterday probably he is here today also okay. uh now as i said as i started there's no words to 
express our happiness and the way you have taken us uh, into higher planes. Uh, Swamiji, uh, as um, it is a, our wish that you please continue to be amongst us as usual, even if you are uh, going to be in a faraway land. And there, Swamiji, my, my personal wish is that as uh, Swami Vivekananda did wonders to the Western world more than a hundred years away, ago, I wish you also do that wonders, Swamiji, because uh, since age-wise I am much senior to you, I find that kind of a difference in you. Hari Om Swami. Sarvesham Svastir Bhavato Sarvesham Shantir Bhavato Sarvesham Purnam Bhavato Sarvesham Manganam Bhavato Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makasya Dukha Bhag Bhavet Asatoma Satkamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purna Mudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om